And without further ado, I present to you Rough Riders by Samuel Faber. friends with Teddy Roosevelt. Who else do you need? Kiss ass. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Do you want a drink? Uh, sure. How about a whiskey? Whiskey? I was talking about water. Well, I'm talking about whiskey. After a game of catch. Well, Jesus Leonard, I ain't no schoolboy. I can down a whiskey after even the smallest amount of physical activity. Whatever you say, Teddy. This is my third to last bottle. Third to last? Shit. Good thing I don't live with you. <laughs> Otherwise the house be as dry as a school. So, how you been, Leonard? It's been a while. Nothing new. The wife is doing all right. My son's starting to help out, too. Oh, this is new. Do you remember the old man who lived about a mile that way? Harvey Boggs? Uh, the one with a really bad limp? Yeah, he ended up losing that leg. Really? Yeah, just a month ago. He told me that happened during the war. I think he told me it was Gettysburg when it happened. Told me the trench foot just stuck with him, and it never messed him up too bad till right now. Of course he noticed it, but didn't want to tell any doctor about it. It ended up traveling up his shin and got all infected. What a shame. But you're a doctor. <clears throat> you didn't want to save his leg or what? Ha! You have never met Harvey Bonds. That man was an ox, you know, all stubborn like. He wanted to put up with whatever problem he had going on with himself. Dumb bastard. He never asked for any type of help. I mean, he lived by himself, never married, no kids. He did everything himself. Well, it's not like he needed it. And he had a fine piece of land, too. I guess so. You still think the war's gonna happen? The one in Spain? Yeah. Well, well of course. After all the talk from the senators and secretaries, it seems like it's about to happen. What made you ask? It just slipped into my mind after talking about Gettysburg. I've been meaning to ask you anyway. Are you gonna fight? When? When's the last time you've ever seen me run away from a fight? <laughs> well, good. Uh, so have you seen my new plan? You made a battle plan already. Potentially. Well, tell me. Well, this war is a big one for our country. There's a lot of people depending on this war. So we need a good plan. Our country depends on it. And we do have a plan. Would you like to hear it? Tell me! Oh, well, I'm starting a cavalry unit. Oh. Well, good. I'm not surprised. All your accomplishments definitely qualify you to lead one. You know, they don't just let anyone fight for a cavalry unit. Well, mine's a little different. It's going to be a volunteer cavalry unit. Volunteer? Listen, I know this seems like it wouldn't work, but I really think it could. I've been thinking about this for a while. We'd be selective in who we choose, obviously, we can't just let anybody join. We could talk to people and see if they're interested. We could talk to ranchers, men who obviously know how to ride horses. I even thought of encouraging college students. They're young, smart men. Hell, most of them play for their college football team. I even thought of including vets who fought the Apaches. That way we have men with experience. We could talk to coal miners, ranchers, hunters, anyone really. 
it seems like we're living in a time where almost everybody is doing something that the average person can't do. I believe that these men and these men's lives, their own difficulties will surely transfer to the battlefield and make them great men. But are the things they've done in the past that great to put them in a cavalry unit? Possibly. Now, I know their job titles, but I don't know what they've specifically done. But with that being said, I'm sure that they're doing things that most people can say they wouldn't do or would even think of doing, including myself. I'm intrigued. You kept saying we, though. Well, of course. I want you to be my commander. Me, not you. Well, yes. I mean, you've won a Medal of Honor, for Christ's sakes. You know war. We both know you know how to lead men. Sure, I'll be there in part, but I want you to be the man in charge of it. I love it. Let's do it. Good. I was hoping you'd say yes. Let's just hope that you're better at leading men than you are at throwing a football. You said that I did good. <coughs> I said that you did better. I'm just kidding. I'd say I have to be going now. I'll keep in touch about the unit and work on that spiral. Yeah, you better work on your bronco riding, partner. Yeehaw! <laughs> guys, try to picture it in your heads. It's fourth down, right? We're down by only two points. The ball is placed about 10 yards to the goal zone. It's pouring outside. We're all covered in mud from our clothes to our faces. The crowd left because they didn't want to get off wet, but we stuck through. We kept playing even though we were absolutely miserable. We're all tired now, but this was our last chance to score a touchdown and win the game. I carried the ball with me past one defender. Quincy blocks another guy. I went right behind him. And I saw the goals on, clear as day. I ran, I ran, and then... Fumble! Yeah, I fumbled. The quarterback hit me. I stayed my feet, but the ball just slipped out. Rolled for a while, I think. Then the big fella from Yale grabbed the ball, and the game was over. <laughs> so easy. Yeah, ball. You did the same thing. Come on now. See these hands? There's no way that ball could have come out of my hands, rain or dry. What other quarterback in the league has hands like these? You sure as hell don't. I should have been out there for that play. Don't give me that shit, Bob. You did the same shit. Well, it's a good thing you boys ever played us Princeton men. Ha! Huh. Everyone knows the men who attend Princeton are men who didn't have the brains or the balls to attend Harvard. What well, we wait for ball games, you farter finger jackass? Well, at least I don't like black, you slow some bitch! All right, hey, let's just calm down. There's a point when friendly bantering turns into bickering. And I will have no bickering on this ship. We're in the Caribbean fighting to prove our unity. Now, you may not have been teammates on the field, but you are now. And with that being said, you do have the balls and brains, sir. <laughs> boy, oh boy. You boys are so lucky you're out there playing that game. Why, if I'd have been going to college, I bet you that I'd been the team's all-star and linebacker. Breaking skulls wide open and not taking any names. Probably not taking any wins either. Oh, what? <laughs> oh, come on now. Don't laugh it in my ear again. What ear? <laughs> hey, Princeton, way to use your brain. You have to admit, it's pretty funny. No, no, go ahead. Have your fun. 
course, especially at your expense. What you say? <laughs> oh, you damn college kids sat beside me on purpose! We just sat at the most convenient spot where we can see and have our fun. You're about to say what again, aren't you? Oh, shut the hell up! <laughs> you dumb sons of bitches! You don't even know how this happened! Well, tell us. Well, all right! Listen up! Cause I'm only gonna say it once. Back when I was the marshal of Dodge City, we had a run-in with the Horace Greenbelts gang. Now, these men were some hard-nosed, drunken, dumb-as-hell Okies who got kicked out of OK City. Well, I remember you telling me that Dodge City was full of trouble. Always. Didn't help that these boys were from out of town. Anyway, I catch word they've been holding up Mother Meredith's saloon in town, trying to take hold of all the brandy, tequila, and mezcal they could find. I walked in when the commotion was just getting started. Mama Meredith come up to me and she's telling me what was happening. And all I thought was, oh shit, here we go. Time for Deputy Marshal Benny Franklin to kick some ass again. I turned to Mother Meredith and I said, Mama Meredith, you might want to wait outside for a while. You don't want to see this. I turn around and I yell out, All right, party's over! One looks at me, then another, then they all do. About five or six of them. And then this Mexican fella at the bar, three sheets of the wind, says, I ain't going nowhere until this bar goes empty. <laughs> and I pulled out my gun and I said, All right, Senior Joe. Then I ain't going nowhere until this gun is empty. It's a standoff for a while. Next thing I know, a chair is thrown at my head. Shots are fired. My backup comes in and it's an all-out brawl. The next thing I know, the fattest man I've ever seen in my life grabs my head and bites my ear halfway off. <laughs> now, I'd seen some drunken bastards before, but I ain't never seen a man as drunk as this man was. I shoved him off of me, but he looked like he was ready to come back for seconds. So I leveled my gun at his head and I blew his brains out. The damn fat ass pig. Who the hell gets that drunk that you want to bit off a man's ear? Hell, I don't know. Anyways, after the coroner came, Mother Meredith comes up to me and she's shouting, What in the southern hell bell happened to your ear? I told her what had happened and she told me that her sister, Betty Lou, was a nurse. She patched my ear right up real good. Then I was feeling a bit ambitious when I asked her if she'd ever been with a man with one ear before. And she said, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like quite a story there, Betty boy. <laughs> I've seen Betty Lou at the saloon before. I bet it wasn't that happy. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, you dumbass! You all can go to hell! Aw, oh, hell. They're just kids, Ben. They're upset because you topped their story. But I'm not sure your story beats my hunting story. Oh, I love a good hunting story. And you're gonna love this one. About a year ago, I was up in hunting elk in the Colorado mountains. It wasn't like hunting bighorn with Teddy, but I never had anything like this happen to me before. No offense. I'm flattered. Good. Well, I was out in the woods, and as snow was coming down that day, you wouldn't have believed it. The area I was hunting was full of brush and trees, and I could have easily missed a great big elk and missed my chance for sight. So I looked around and I saw a tree, decided I'd go up it. Got up in that tree, sat there for about 10 minutes. Didn't see anything. Was thinking maybe it's a bad idea. So I got out, went out on a branch, and I heard behind me. Snow was crunching, 
brush was breaking, there were twigs breaking, and I knew whatever it was would run off if I turned around and I had to look. So I said a little prayer. Whatever it is that I can see will come into my sight. Now, if there is any prayer in my life that I wish I'd take back, it was that one. Because it came out and it weren't no help. It was a great big black bear. I mean, it was enormous. You can't imagine how big this was. And you would think that it wouldn't see me because I was up in that tree. But I assumed that this bear walked that same path his whole life. And today, it was different. He knew something was different. He assumed that things weren't the way they ought to be. And he knew this day was not a normal day. Well, I stayed up on that tree and I stayed real quiet. But it didn't matter. Because just something then gave him the premonition to look up. We locked up. He started to climb and climb, and he got both feet off the ground, and he got his hind feet off the ground. Pretty soon, his claws just about grabbed the end of my boot. I knew right then I had to think fast. I grabbed my muzzleloader, I pointed it at his face, and he opened up with an enormous roar. I took aim and fired. that was a big bear from the vibrations in the tree when his body hit the ground. I just stood and looked at that nightmarish carcass on the ground. Christ Almighty, what'd you do with the body? What? As the first day I cooked and ate bear, I dragged him all the way back to my cabin. I skinned him, which took forever. It was huge. And I cooked him all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a hell of a story. I suppose. What do you say, Captain? Ain't that a man? <laughs> you claim shooting a big, soft, cuddly bear makes you a man. You think you could do better? I'd like to see you in that tree. Why? You think I couldn't handle it? I just think you don't. Imagine how big that bear was in your simpleton mind of yours. <laughs> well, if it was the size of the army of the damn Apaches, I think I'd have my work cut out for me. Not the Apache stories. Not just the Apaches. The damn Apaches. And we had to listen to that bear story, so I don't want to hear no lip. Besides, you'll be on the edge of your seats for this one. So there I was, out on the river, searching for water to bring back up to our camp. It's pretty simple, like the other days, I go and fill my canteen, except I heard some screaming. A man screamed. I followed the screams for about a few steps until I looked down the hill, and I saw one of our soldiers, George, surrounded by three Apache bastards. The savages scalped the man alive. Thank God Almighty I had my crack with me, or else I would have been a dead man when they spotted me. I used just three shots in them under five seconds. Bang, bang, bang. Well, goddamn. Did you help him? Well, son, this poor bastard is far from living, yet so far from death. <clears throat> if I walked that way before he started screaming, I probably could have saved him. I walked down that hill and he was just disoriented, wailing, crying in pain, holding the top of his head together. And I say together because they didn't scalp him all the way. Those savages sliced his head halfway through. I just stood there and watched him roll around in pain until he looked me in the eyes, screaming like a banshee at the top of his lungs, and I had never seen anything like it in my life. 
At that moment, I realized he wasn't pulling his skin into place. He was trying to rip it off. Something, I don't know if it was the spirit of the dead Apaches possessing him, trying to finish the job, or if he just gave up. I couldn't stand to see a man in that condition because I knew there was no saving him. All I could do was say a quick prayer and send him up to heaven for the other day he should have been. You killed him? Like I said, I was a changed man. I've known George. He was the first man I ever trained in our company. I knew him very well. He was a very soft-spoken guy who never had anything good or bad to say about anyone. We've been through a lot of battles together. After what those savages did to him, it was like he was broken. He just had enough of it. And it was all by the hands of those damn engines. Hey! Calm down. We have one on the ship tonight. A holder man, remember? Just take it easy. Well, I'm sorry. But they're all the same. You know, when we came here, we found them. Just because they're different tribes or whatever, doesn't make them that much different. They're all the same luring sons of bitches I've ever seen. <laughs> the prawn now. You're mean. You're tough. But you, my friend, are a son of a bitch. <laughs> We're all sons of bitches. We all gotta be tough and mean. We're the Rough Riders. Now, how about another drink? <laughs> you crazy bastard. Yeah, I'll drink to that. <laughs> like I say, with this group of men, this would be a war over at sunset. Let's drink! Cheers! Cheers! A toast to the start of the cycle. Was that Bucky? Yes, it was me. What did you mean? Well, you know, the cycle of war. We don't like someone, we attack. They don't like us, they attack. We toast to our victory or the fall. And then it just repeats. Oh, uh, come on. Ah, uh, hell, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I can't believe it. You would still choose to fight. Being a battlefield doctor, I am sure you have seen more gruesome casualties than any man could in his entire life, or soldier. Well, yes, but someone's got to do it, right? Now, I fought the Apache too. I have seen horrors that no man could ever describe. But we all know it's got to get done somehow, just like it was done with Holderman's people. Where are you getting at, buddy? Just sounds to me like we're very similar to the people who came to the country and killed all them poor natives. Not entirely. Well, but you just said that they, Holderman's people, we're all the same murdering sons of bitches, referring to the Apaches. And his people don't know the Apaches. So, doesn't that make us the same? What are you trying to say? Look, you just said about Holderman that he was the same as the Apaches. So, if that's true, which I think that you believe, then doesn't that make us the same as every white man that came to this country and killed all his poor ancestors? I mean, what? Is that what you want me to say? Because it sure as hell sounds like it. Just sounds like a fact, the way you're putting it. I'm not putting it that way. You are. Look, I'm just trying to make sense of it. You said. Yeah. 
I said that. You yes. said they were all the same. Yeah, so, I then did. Then how are we not the same, Caprone? Look, that's different, you. We're the same, and you know it. The Apaches are lower than dirt. And as of every single board, we should go to bodies. So, does that mean that we deserve every arrow through our bodies for the taking over of their land and murdering all of their people, wives, and children? There is no goddamn difference, Caprone. Think about it. Okay. All right. All right, think about this. Where would we be right now if we didn't do that? Probably not in a world that is so full of shit. For sake! Look, you know I love this country just as much as you do. But you gotta admit, there are just some things that are horrible right now. Okay. So let me see if I got this right. You're not, just, you're not a traitor. You're just weak. You claim to fight for your country, but you can never lead it. If people like you were in charge of our country, then it would really turn to shit. It is not cowardice. Then what is it? How would you explain it? Why would you choose to talk things out within our country than being a man standing up for what you believe in? Would your father be happy with their decisions? The back down to a country when they're ready to take over your land, pillage your town, and kill your wife and kids. You got a son. He just started his first year at secondary school. I bet you're proud. And a daughter? She just turned four? I remember when I came over to the house that one time. She was cute as a button with her blonde curls, giving her dad a kiss on the cheek before going out to help her mom in a countryside garden to pick garlic and tomatoes. Now imagine coming home one day and finding them in the same condition that I found my friend George. And all that shit would happen because their daddy didn't have the fucking guts to stand up to the bad guys coming to our country. I don't think you want that. So why then? Why do you choose to be so passive? Because I still believe in humanity! I believe that since we claim that our country is so great and that we are the greatest country in the whole wide world, then we can learn to stop the bloodshed, the carnage, the anxiety, and the horror that is war! It is not weakness. It is progression. And don't you dare try to tell me that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Because I do! When I fought the Apaches, and when I was doing my time in Arizona, I committed the most horrible crime any man could do. You boys ought to listen to this one. I was out in the woods, just patrolling. Looking for anything out of the ordinary. Yet, yet so was his Apache boy. He was just a little older than my daughter. A little older. He had his bow and arrows. Looking around for supper, most likely. I hid in the brush. Hoping that he wouldn't see me. But I swear, he must have walked that path for his whole life. You see, 
that day, he assumed something was not right. When he looked at me, aiming that arrow, I knew I was dead. But something stopped him. He was crying. I don't blame him. I would have done the exact same thing if I was in his shoes. I knew no arrow was going to stop him from killing me. Have you ever seen your enemy cry when he's about to kill you? When he's trying to do the exact same thing his enemy is doing? One thing I learned that day is that savages have emotions too. But I was just a soldier, following orders, and I said a very quick prayer and sent him up to heaven way earlier than he should have been. Well, but I guess that's what we're all born to do. And it's never gonna stop the way I see it. It's our lives. It's what separates the men from the boys and the men from the savages. That savage couldn't kill me because I, he, he was crying. And I killed him without a tear. Who's the savage now? But I was young then. Now I know the feeling of having children. Savage or not, no parent should ever carry that grief. I wish I knew why our fellow men can't have compassion for each other like a parent does for their child. But here we are, sailing to Cuba. I can't have my son living in a world like that in the future, doing what his old man did. I tell you, the day I prayed to one day Wear the uniform like my old man did at Antietam would be the only prayer in my life I would ever take back. Say we ought to call it a night, boys. Head to your bunks. I'll wake you in the morning. Well, quite a night. I'll say, are you still having doubts? There's not a single doubt in my mind. Really? I thought that you would be regretting this whole thing by now. That you would think that this would be a bust now that everyone's going soft. I'll talk to them in the morning. But nobody on this ship is going soft. We we're just telling stories. You're a religious man, aren't you, Leonard? Yes, of course. And you know how Jesus died? Of course. Of course. Do you know that crucifixion is no longer a method of execution in any other country in this world? Know why? Because it's a barbaric way of killing a man. 
You see, you just hang there by the weight of your palms, hammered in with nails. And then you just wait there, waiting to die. And Jesus carried that thing with him for miles to a place where he knew they'd kill him. That'd be like wearing a noose as a necklace, walking in the town square just to be hung with it. Now, I've been hearing an expression lately amongst people, mostly in the monastery by fathers and brothers. The expression goes, we all have our own cross to bear. We all have our own cross, Leonard. And it just so happens that these men's crosses are heavier than any other person I know. And in their lives, they will feel the weight of these crosses. It will hurt them. It will damage them. It's going to change them forever. They will carry these crosses with them until the day they die. But after tonight, I know the weight of their crosses will not break these men. Do you still believe we'll win this war? There's not a single doubt in my mind. Well, I hope so. We land tomorrow morning. I'm ready. Are you going to sleep? My cross hardly ever lets me sleep. <laughs>